Judea Black, Shalom and I'm Purified Drinking Water. Last video of the day, man, and I'll see y'all tomorrow. Um, we were just talking about the Black uh, National Anthem, Pledge of Allegiance, or whatever that was. Uh, let's give, um, uh, let's do the original one. We'll talk about that. This is the true story of the Pledge of Allegiance, okay? Um, minus the Negro one that I just, we just watched two videos on. Anyway, Shalom and I'm Judea Black. Cue that music I like. See you tomorrow. We'll rub it, beat it to pay for as long as the state can divide. Keeps burning on me as long as I'm comfortable. Pledge of Allegiance. If movies have taught me anything, it's that school kids all across the states all learn the ritual of the pledge, from the solemn words to the standing to attention, right hand positioned over the heart. The Pledge of Allegiance is such a part of American culture that it is easy to imagine that it has always been so, perhaps first conducted at the signing of the Declaration of Independence by the Founding Fathers. But no, in fact the pledge has a much shorter but extremely surprising history. For starters, it was written by this guy, Francis Bellamy only in 1892. The original words were, I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It wasn't until 1923 that the addition of to the flag of the United States of America was added. Then in 1954, President Eisenhower decided that it needed a bit of a tweak to one nation under God. So okay, the words have changed. That's no big deal, right? Well, what is interesting is who wrote the original pledge. Francis Bellamy was a Baptist minister. Yet despite his religious calling, he was firmly of the opinion that the separation of church and state was of supreme importance, and so had very deliberately not included any religious terminology in the pledge. In fact, when Eisenhower added his addition, Bellamy's daughter objected to the combination for this very reason. But Eisenhower was concerned about the threat represented by communism, and so thought that the pledge needed that greater focus to counter the dangers of left-wing ideology. So, he probably wouldn't have been very keen on Bellamy Sr.'s own thinking on this, because Bellamy was a socialist. To be specific, a Christian socialist. This blends Christianity with socialism, justifying this on the grounds that in the early church, as mentioned in Acts 2, all the believers were together, and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Obviously the theological and ideological basis and thinking is a bit more complex than I'm spelling out here, but I'm sure you get the idea. According to one of his biographers, Bellamy believed in the rights of working people, and the equal distribution of economic resources, which he believed was inherent in the teachings of Jesus. I am not sure what those sorts of ideas would get him labelled as in modern America, but I have some suspicions. Anyway, Bellamy wrote the pledge as a way for Americans to pull together in the post-reconstruction era, so as to go out into the world as a brave new and united nation. Well, partly. It was also a bit of a marketing gimmick. In 1892, he was working for the Youth's Companion, a magazine for children and young adults. One of the publication's major campaigns was to have an American flag in every school in the United States, which the magazine had sold to them. In 1892, flag sales were down, and so something was needed to promote the schoolhouse flag movement. What was needed was some sort of ceremony. Now, it's not fair to say the Pledge of Allegiance was simply a market employer to sell flags. No doubt Bellamy and those he worked with genuinely believed in the principles. But it is fair to say that the Pledge of Allegiance was partially a market employer to sell flags. And of course, there needed to be some sort of ceremony to go along with the recitation of the pledge, a salute to the flag. Otherwise, what would have been the point of selling the flags in the first place? And Bellamy had that covered as well. 
as his published instructions stated. At a signal from the principal, the pupils, in ordered ranks, hands to their sides, face the flag. Another signal is given. Every pupil gives the flag the military salute. Right hand lifted, palm downward to align with the forehead and close to it. Ooh. To be fair, Bellamy was first, and one has to wonder if the salute like certain other symbols that are forbidden by YouTube, was appropriated by a certain later political movement. And that, in fact, leads us to that other famed element of the Pledge of Allegiance, the right hand over the heart. This was actually introduced into law by Congress in December 1942, basically because of, you know, that other guy. Naturally, some people weren't happy about this, Johnny Foreigner stealing our salute that kind of thing, but it became the accepted and correct form. As an aside, the fact that the Bellamy salute, as it was called, was used right up until late 1942, explains why a number of Americans from the time have since been accused of having fascist sympathies. I mean, they might have had fascist sympathies, 